All right, good afternoon, everybody. The time is 3.32, and we're gonna go ahead and call the meeting to order. At this time, I see Dr. Noel has joined us in our meeting today. Dr. Noel, would you like to say a few words before we begin? Yeah, just say good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your day. This is a, the SHAC committee is a very important committee. And, and so for all of you CIC employees, thank you for making time of your day to be here. But a really big special thank you to our community members, parents um, that are taking the time to be on the call today. We have um, great experts that we're fortunate that live here in our community and, and they're joining us on the call today. So we appreciate you. Um, I know that Wade and the team will share with you about the roles and responsibilities of the SHAC, but uh, you know our elected board of trustees do a wonderful job of leading our district, but they count on uh, us having subcommittees out there that you know really dig into the weeds in certain areas and make recommendations to them, and that that is your primary role here as the SHAC. And uh, so you know, I encourage you to be active participants, and uh, we're glad you're here. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noel. I'd like to take a moment also to thank all the returning members this year. Thank you guys for being a part of this and volunteering your time and joining us today. Um, you know, we did a lot of work last year. This work, this work will continue this year. And I really appreciate all of you who were with us last year and with us again this year. But I do want to take just a few moments and welcome some new members to our group this year, uh, some of, of whom have participated uh, in the past and are rejoining our shack this year. Uh, not everyone may be on the call, but I'd like to announce their names anyway, because you may recognize several of them. We have Michelle Scaife, uh, Extension Agent for Better Living for Texans, Texas A&M AgriLife. Jill Barrera, Senior CSR QC Tech with Maximus Texas Health Steps. Uh, Erica Alleman, Nutrition Education Coordinator, Montgomery County Food Bank. Captain Matt Blakelock, Conroe ISD Police Department. Lindsay Taylor, Conroe ISD Mental Health Specialist. William Kelly, Principal Headmaster, Academy for Science and Health Professions. We also have Marie Ashby, Katie Quarles, and Kaylin Harrison, students at the Academy for Science and Health Professions. They're gonna be our student representatives this year. We're very proud and happy to have them with us and welcome guys, we appreciate all of you. Our first item on the agenda <clears throat> will be the approval of the minutes from the June 17th SHAC meeting. A draft copy of the minutes was distributed through the email to all members of the SHAC prior to today's meeting. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Okay, if there are no corrections, the minutes stand approved as distributed. The next item on our agenda is a presentation on the purpose of the SHAC presented by Dr. Shelley Winkler, Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Schools. Dr. Winkler. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, as um, Mr. Haymark and Dr. Noel said, the SHAC committee is a really important committee, and especially this year because we've got um, some things to look at with our curriculum, and so it's going to be really important um, that we have um, all of you as active participants. So um, you joining us today uh, is um, very appreciated. Um, so before we start, we wanted to make sure that you kind of understood um, what SHAC um, did or, or, or didn't do and what your role is in SHAC. And so I have a, a quick little presentation. Some of you may have seen it before. I will warn you ahead of time. There is a video in there. There's not many videos on SHAC participation, believe it or not. So this one is a little dated and it is from Texas. So you will see some obligatory Texas hair in there, um, but it's still really uh, good information that um, I think that you'll appreciate. Um, and we'll go through to uh, some of us are voting members and some of us are not voting members. Um, some of us like uh, uh, that, uh, that you see on the screen, those are people that are meant to be experts um, when it comes to SHAC. Um, and so we'll make sure over the next few meetings, you know who um, who is a voting member and who is not, um, so that when we go to vote on something, um, you'll know whether you're supposed to raise your hand for yes or no. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and start our little presentation today and I am in school and so if you hear children in the background um, that's okay or teachers <laughs> that's okay all right so again uh, you are a part of the school health advisory council and we refer to that as um, the SHAC and so sometimes you will hear that referred to as the SHAC committee 
Um, and here's a little video. This is the video I was telling about that we're going to show um, about some SHAC committees over the state of Texas and what they um, have done in their own communities. In Northeast ISD, our School Health Advisory Council, or SHAC, has been very um, instrumental in changing policy, supporting recess policies, um, looking for more opportunities to improve nutrition on the campus during the school day, as well as um, improve activity opportunities for our students. So through policy and um, positive influence on our PTAs and stuff, we have seen fundraising at some of our schools become only um, about activity rather than food-based. So those are some really positive changes that have occurred due to our SHAC's involvement. When I first got there, wellness wasn't well-defined, so that was kind of the first thing we did was set out and said, okay, so what are we going to talk about when we talk about wellness? And so we put in a vision for wellness and, and a plan to achieve it. And what that's led to seven years later is now we have subcommittees based on those areas that we defined as good for wellness. What I would like other school administrators to know is that a SHAC can be very, very helpful. It's not just another meeting that you're required to have by law. It's not just another organization that you have to deal with on a regular basis, but it's actually something that can help you and benefit your district and your students. We all believe that children's school health is important. We know that healthy kids make better scores on tests. We know that healthy kids make better learners. We know that physically, emotionally, and mentally healthy kids are happier and, and more well-adjusted children. So we all know that it's extremely important for us to dedicate time and effort to that, and that's how a SHAC can, can help your district. I think the SHAC, like a lot of different SHACs, um, benefits the students by providing a voice from the community. There are mostly parents on our SHAC, so they're uh, are aware of what the problems and the issues are in the schools and what topics need to be brought forth. Um, there are a lot of concerned parents who uh, have had those discussions with their students and they know what's wrong with the recess policies in their different elementary schools or uh, where the school lunches are failing or where they're succeeding or what we need to do with the different health education models. So I think that having a strong parental uh, involvement in the SHAC uh, through the appointments from the school board has been a great benefit to our students. We have uh, members from all walks of life in our SHAC committee that give us the exposure to all the members of the community, what the thought process is, what the challenge is. And the student involvement is a big factor that I think because we are there for the students. And if you listen to them and if you come up with a solution, that's what makes SHACs what we are. So I think that's the biggest achievement that we are looking into and hopefully we'll able to conquer it more and more every day, every time. We've had a lot of, of um, benefits provided for our students um, in areas of curriculum, uh, programs, access, uh, staff development coming in, uh, helping um, uh, to train our teachers. Uh, and then this year, one of the things we started was student wellness team so that we could start building leadership in our students to manage their own um, wellness. Students have challenges with the food that are being served in the cafeteria. And they wanted to bring the Subway sandwiches into the cafeteria, but because of the cost involvement and the numbers, uh, we cannot bring the Subway because of the, that percentage that we have to pay on every sandwiches. But what our food official, uh, Judy Houston, did, that she got a chef from New York, and they are making a special sandwiches that are emulating just as a Subway or even better. And that's going to be rolled out in the spring season and it's going to be marketed with the help of the students and they are told to come up with the cool name to attract the student population and that's their that's their idea that we just borrowed it and now we're going to implement it all over the school district in Millen High Schools in Corpus Christi. Interestingly enough the way students got involved in my shack is members of the shack would bring their kids to meetings and so initially we did not have any students on our shack but after ball practice, one of the parents would pick their child up and bring them in. And so I would gather those kids up around the table and ask their opinions on things too. And so it was an informal process at first. Now we usually ask for volunteers and the counselors at the high school usually get me a high school student. And occasionally we'll have an elementary student show up too. And so that's always fun. Okay, so you can, um, you can see from 
uh, this particular video, there's a, a very um, passionate shack, and I, I believe the school representative um, and the parents um, said it really well um, that this committee can make some changes. They talked about recess. A couple of years ago, we tackled recess. Um, our director of child nutrition, Robin, is also on this committee. You heard them talk about school lunches, and those are the issues in their school district. It might not be the issues in ours always, but um, you know, those are some of the things that we have or we could tackle, you know, in the future. One of them talked about making sure that um, there were that rewards weren't always food based, and that was something we also did um, a few years ago. So it's um, an opportunity to really impact 67,000 children um, in our schools. So um, like we said, your participation on, um, on this committee is uh, very much appreciated and will be um, very much impacted um, at each of our individual schools. So uh, by law, SHAC has to meet um, a minimum of four times a year. Um, you will see we're, we're going to meet just a little bit more than that because we have some business to attend to um, this year to present to the board about um, some of our our, um, health curriculum. Um, by state law, you know, we have to appoint at least five people um, to SHAC, and we took that to our September board meeting, um, but it mainly has to be parents, um, and so that's why we have parents on this committee, and just like uh, the um, the school official in the video stated, we have some students as well, and their participation is very meaningful, and their perspective is um, very important through this process. So the committee uh, must provide um, the board with recommendations on issues concerning the school's health education curriculum, which that is a big part of what we're going to do this year. Um, any modifications to policies that we've had in the past. Um, and then we will um, report that it will be on our website. We're under the Open Meetings Act this year. So all of our meetings will be online and um, we will um, present any recommendations for that curriculum to the board. And then at the end of the year, we'll present to them an overview of, of what we did this year. So who else makes up the committee? We said parents. We have some teachers, we have administrators on the committee, we have students, and um, we'll have some healthcare professionals, uh, our business community members, law enforcement, um, and senior citizens is on the actual list. So if you are a senior citizen, um, we did not pick you up maybe because of age, you might have been into one of these others. Um, clergy members and non-profit health organizations is who um, by law can, can be a part of the committee. So why are you here? Because you are representing um, our community. A lot of decisions that we make, state law may say that we have to do um, certain things or might be certain protocols that we have to do, but we always wanna make sure that the voice of our community is heard in all of our decisions that we're making. And so you are the voice of our community. You're going to reflect um, different values within different um, areas of our school district. It's a very large school district of 348 square miles. Um, so you're, you will be, um, voicing your beliefs in your um, particular community. Um, and you will also um, give advice. You had heard one of them say um, on the video about recess. That's how we um, came to this. We had some parents that had, um, had uh, voiced a concern about recess. We talked about that. Um, coordinated health programming, you're going to hear about today with um, what's called the CATCH program and how we can just in general make students healthier. And then again, you're going to assist the district in ensuring that our values are reflected in, in the health education program that we're going to talk about quite a bit this year. So the local, um, the, the SHAC, the local SHAC, um, will determine the number of hours of instruction in health education. And we'll also talk about grade level appropriateness for some of our curriculum. Um, we always wanna make sure that our kids are healthy. Um, we do that through the fitness gram and things like that, but are there other things um, that we can add to that curriculum to make sure that our students are, are staying healthy? So an example of that, a couple of years ago, we did um, some uh, presentations on vaping when vaping was fairly new um, and how we could make sure that we were um, ensuring that students were staying um, informed of uh, vaping and what that meant um, in their, their lives and, in, and for their health. And then appropriate grade levels and methods of instruction for human sexuality. Um, and again, that is part of the health curriculum that we will talk about this year. 
Um, so at the meetings um, today, we're going to nominate a chair um, and the chair and Mr. Haymark will always call the meetings to order. We're going to um, review and then ask for approval of a, a minutes from the previous meeting, kind of like you would see in one of our local school board uh, meetings. Um, you will have those in advance to review and they will be online. And so if you see any errors, it's important that um, you let us know of those so that we can all um, make sure that those are correct. And then agenda items are going to be um, informational. They could be community outreach um, so that we're making informed decisions. So some of our presentations might not require any action, but they are setting us up with information to make some informed um, decisions. And then we'll have a call to vote on items. Some members are voting members and others are, are not. Um, the schedule that we have when we have um, big things to vote on will be in person. And so we will have a visual on your on your seat or at your desk to know um, that if you're a voting member or not to help you through that. Um, there may at some point in your time on SHAC be a need for subcommittees and we'll create those if the need arises. Um, and then in the future, um, Mr. Haymark is just about a year into this, um, but we have talked about that mission and vision statement that you heard on the video for our SHAC. Um, and we will have active discussion on items brought to our committee or things that we're required to review. Um, and one of those things will be Proclamation 2022 um, to address that health and PE um, instructional materials. So these are our meeting dates. Today is our first one. Uh, we'll have th the next three will be in person in our CISD boardroom. Um, the reason we ha we're having it in our boardroom is because we are required to have that open meetings um, and that is the best place for recording. So that's, and just in case you're wondering why it's there, um, because it has that room already has the capability to record. And then our last one on June 14th will be um, for Zoom. And if no one has any other questions about what the purposes of Zoom, I will hand, I mean, of Zoom, of Shaq, I will hand it back over to Mr. Haymark. All right. Thank you, Dr. Winkler. Uh, very good explanation of the purpose of the Shaq. Um, and as Dr. Winkler mentioned, uh, one of the state laws, one of the requirements of the Shaq is that we nominate a uh, parent to serve as co chair for the Shaq. So with that, nominations are now in order. I'll begin by nominating Mrs. Misty Westover to serve as co-chair for the SHAC. Mrs. Misty Westover. Are there further nominations? Okay, if there are no further nominations, the nominations are now closed. We're gonna vote now. All those in favor of Mrs. Westover for co-chair of the SHAC, please type yes in the chat. All those opposed, please type no. Just a yes or no in the chat, please. I'll pull it up to monitor. Mr. Haymark, that is a unanimous yes and a yes and a big thank you from a couple of people. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you, Dr. Wayne, for seeing that for me. I appreciate it. I was trying to catch up with this myself. So thank you guys for voting and thank you, uh, Ms. Westover, for volunteering for this. Uh, we're very happy to have you on board. Uh, so uh, for the SHAC Committee for the 2021-22 school year, Ms. Westover will serve as parent co-chair for the SHAC Committee. Thank you. Okay, our next item is an update on Proclamation 2022, and this will be presented by Dr. Edith Upshaw, Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning. Dr. Upshaw. Thank you, Mr. Haymark. I just want to make sure I sound okay and don't have any mic issues. <laughs> sound great. <laughs> I didn't do a mic check like Dr. Hines before. Sometimes <laughs> that happens to us. So I come to you with a pleasure to talk to you a little bit about the process for Proclamation 2022. So that really is the process that we go through in our district on an annual basis to adopt instructional materials for a certain subject. 
In the state of Texas, those adoptions of materials are ran through our instructional materials allotment and also by a district IMA committee. And so they rotate anywhere from eight to 10 years on adopting new books according to our state standards that are also updated in that process. So what is different from other years is that what we're adopting this next school year is going to be instructional materials for physical education. That means our PE classes everywhere we offer PE from the littles all the way up to the high school credit course, and then also for health. So I'm going to share with you a timeline, which is the timeline of the instructional materials process. And why is it important to the SHAC? Because the SHAC will receive recommendation from a district committee that we put together. And the SHAC committee is the committee that sends the recommendation to the school board of the materials that were put in forth for the health and physical education curriculum. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, screen share my timeline so I can walk you through that. I promise I will not read every single thing. And this will be referenced also on our website where we're going to be putting this material if you wanna look at it um, at a later time. So what basically we're doing is coming to you today on our, uh, on our meeting to have the conversation about walking you through this process. So the state of Texas um, goes through a rigorous process a year and a half before on looking at the curriculum or what we call the TEKS to be able to see how they're going to get adjusted for both, both physical education and um, our health course. They're in the process of doing the technical overview of them now. Basically, they're set in stone. The only thing that they're doing now is making sure that there's no grammatical errors. Hopefully, I'm correct on that, Mr. Haymark. You can correct me if, if, I, if, if I've got that off a little bit. But what they do is then that they give that curriculum or those TEAC standards to publishers out there that are going to produce materials, books, or online curriculum to be able to have, uh, to be able to implement that in the classrooms. Those materials get um, looked at by a group of educators in the state of Texas. You have to apply to be part of that committee. That committee meets in the summer. And in order to make the state approved list, the product of publishers around the country that come forth to be able to be part of Texas adoption have to meet at least 50% alignment with the standards of these courses. Then they go through some final review, and then they will release to our district the name and the whole state of Texas on December the 1st on what these materials are that we can then choose from to be able to implement in our district. So in the background, what we do, we have this huge textbook process in our school district where Mr. Haymark will reach out and he will have what they call campus contacts. Campus contacts are the people that we communicate with to make sure that those materials are being shipped to the campus for teacher review. In addition to the campus contacts, we have a district committee. That committee will look at all the surveys and responses from our teachers and um, they will review it. They will look at all the surveys and see what are the top two or three resources that the teachers are saying that they want to implement this curriculum. That district committee will meet later on in the semester around January to look at those resources and bring in the final one to two um, publishers to give the final presentation for us to move forward. So once that committee has done all that work, that committee will then come to the shack. And I think I'm going to go ahead and scroll through here. That meeting will be on January the 26th. And we will come to you to show you what our recommendation is, not only of the surveys, but from the top two publishers, what it is we're going to want to recommend to be adopted. To be clear, we don't adopt anything through this process that is not on the state list or on the state board of education list. There's also something that I want to show you just so that you're aware of this. There is a public review um, that is time for the community anywhere from January the 13th to January the 31st where the materials are available. And this will be a little bit different depending on the year. Last year, because it was COVID, we had to do this public review online because there was no way to come into a building to review the materials. But that doesn't mean that that won't happen this year as well. Just depending how the materials are released to us, there's a time frame where the community can come and have their input to look at the materials and also be able to weigh in on what's being provided to teach this particular curriculum to our students. So um, that information will also be presented to you at this January 26th meeting. And um, we will go to a final recommendation. Let me make sure 
that we don't have another meeting with you guys. Yes, we'll have another meeting with you guys on uh, February the 28th to have any further questions. And then from there, this committee will submit the final recommendation to the school board. So this is something that's very important that we want you to think about because the two things that we're looking at this curriculum is how we're going to be um, teaching the human sexuality piece for our students specifically in the health course and also mental health. So it's important that this committee um, kind of stamps or approves our process. So in years past, we have gone through the SHAC committee and we just wanna make sure to be very transparent through this. So if there's any questions you have throughout the process, you can email Mr. Haymark or myself to make sure that we are communicating with you any questions or any particular questions you might have that we want to include in this process with our teachers, please feel free to share with us. But today was really just an overview of you will be part of our extension of the committee that makes that final recommendation to the school board. Do you have any questions for me about this process? Um, I have a question. This is Bryce Spear. Um, are the members, you know, you said you guys get down to two different um, publishers, if you will, of, of specific um, curriculum. When you, for the people who select those final two um, publishers to be presented to the SHAC, um, do we, is there a full conflict of interest disclosure amongst all of the people voting on those last two um, publishers that get presented to our committee where um, we're identifying any potential conflicts of interest? Actually, we do have that meeting and that's coming up on November the 8th. We have a uh, district uh, guidelines for campus contacts and district committee members. So if they happen to be that campus contact or a district committee member that's related to someone that works for a publishing company, they have to excuse themselves from that role. They have to be in a situation where they do not have that conflict of interest. So we do guarantee that. And that's not only exclusive to this process, it's for all processes in our school district. And um, Ms. Spear, just to kind of be clear, sometimes it's two publishers, sometimes it's three. It depends, or four, it depends what the surveys come back, right? If teachers, it's um, it's usually, we're not gonna invite all 15 publishers if they didn't get the same kind of votes, right? So we take it from every PE teacher in the district, every health teacher and the teacher voting. And then the top, um, the top selections are the ones that we take that deeper dive in the district community to make sure that we dot all our I's and cross all our T's and what we'll be adopting. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, thank you for the question. Any other questions for myself or Mr. Haymark? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. It's appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Upshaw. It was an excellent explanation of what we do have coming up. And I think if you guys noticed in the chat, uh, Mrs. Blakelock shared some information about uh, all the information for the meetings available. Also, there's a link to our SHAC uh, council in uh, the chat, so you're able to share that as well. Uh, click on that as well. Mr. Hamar, like. um, and if there's any confusion about voting, if, you, if you're if you um, okay, if I share my screen really quick. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you're confused about whether you vote or not, so if you're on the committee, um, you are a voter, except if you're in yellow. And so that would be Mr. Colshan, Dr. Medford, myself, Dr. Ebshaw, Mr. McCord, Mr. Chavez, Ms. Gerson, Coach Long, Ms. Cresswell, and Robin Hughes. So just a, this was our board policy that um, was submitted or our board item that was submitted um, for our membership. And so if you have any questions, that's who's not voting. Thank you, Dr. Winkler. And also, uh, we've updated our list of membership as well on the SHAC website, on Conroe ISD website, and it's also listed there, voting members, not voting members as well. Thank you, Dr. Winkler. Okay, our next item on the agenda is the CATCH program. CATCH stands for Coordinated Approach to Child Health, and this presentation will be given by Jessie Orlando. She is a Conroe ISD physical education facilitator. Uh, she's done quite a, a bit of work with the CATCH program and studied it very well. Uh, so you guys know we have uh, purchased a license for all of our elementaries and K through six campuses so far this year uh, to institute CATCH on their campuses. We've also purchased materials for them. So that has been distributed. 
Uh, but uh, Coach Orlando is, does a wonderful job with this, and we're looking forward to our presentation. Jesse, if you're ready. There we go. OK, now you can hear me, right? Yes. OK, thank you, Wade. So hi, yes, my name is uh, Jesse Orlando, and I'm uh, also a coach at uh, PE coach at Bradley Elementary, and I'm also the district PE facilitator. And um, I call myself a biggest advocate and passionate about CATCH program. Been teaching it since uh, 2013. So um, very excited to share with you. Let me uh, share the screen. Can you see it? Yes, perfect. Okay, so uh, like uh, Wade said, uh, CATCH stands for Coordinated Approach to Child's Health. It's new and improved. We had a new um, and improved meeting on the 21st of September of this year. Uh, it was very exciting to see all these new things coming for us because it's amazing. So let the overview is what it is and what it would look like. Um, I'm just going to say that um, I want to review a few slides uh, before we head into deep into catch. So you can see in the red uh, map that, uh, you know, the numbers are showing that, you know, obesity and overweight, it's just a trend in the America. Let me see. Oops, there we go. Um, it's also published in an article in 2019. Uh, it said that if America continues on this trend, by 2030, half of our population will be considered obese. Now, the part that I always uh, get a little sad is that childhood obesity, um, it's also a trend in the children. So we can see that uh, 19.3% of our kids are affected. Now, on, sorry. And this um, the, uh, chart right here, I just want you to look a little bit that in the 70s, the trend was that only 5% of our children, um, you know, were in the statistics. But from like 20, 30 years from there to now, we're seeing numbers that are like in the 17, 19%, that triple from the 70s to right now. And um, the question when I ask, even I will ask this to the students, what happened? What's the difference between, you know, back in the 70s to the 2020s? And it's that kids are now more sedentary. They're watching more TV, video games uh, at home. Now mom and dad work. So most of the time mom is in a hurry. So we are eating more processed food, less, you know, whole food. All of those things are, you know, the reasons why all these things have changed since, you know, like 30 years ago. Um, let's see. So that's where he brings us to catch and why this uh, program is so amazing. And it's amazing that our district, you know, has this curriculum to teach. So CATCH stands for Coordinated Approach to Child's Health. CATCH is a whole child online resource for creating and maintaining a healthy school environment. Because if you change the environment, behavior will follow. And, and that's like my motto at school. I encourage everybody in the school, all the adults, all the staff to be the model, you know, for our children. Now, why CATCH? Um, I'll say because it works. It really works. I started CATCH in 2013 and um, I implemented it at Sam Houston Elementary. That year we, uh, we got a grant from uh, United Way and also the Living Healthy Montgomery County. We got a grant and um, we introduced catch like full blown into uh, Sam Houston. And it was amazing to see how much our kids learn and the whole staff and all the teachers were, you know, being models to our children. It, it was a great culture that it was uh, being taught, you know, about catch. So um, you said, okay, well, why we want to introduce all these healthy things? We all know we're on the SHAC committee, but we know that better, you know, you will see better academic performance 
when kids are healthier. You will have better behavior if kids are healthier. You will have more attendance if the kids are healthy. So um, I'm gonna say, I read it on an article that, you know, just by having healthier kids, you can improve 10% of the, you know, a standardized test that the kids take in school, just by eating a healthier breakfast, just by being active, you know, every day, all of those things um, improve their academic, their behavior, and their emotional state in the in the school. So we have this one here. I, I love it. It says better physical fitness is better test scores, better nutrition, better test scores, better physical fitness, better attendance. When I talk about attendance, I'm I'm always saying yes. If your kid is healthier, more likely the kid will go to school because they don't get sick as many times, you know, when the kids is not healthy. So what is the goal of uh, CATCH? The goal of CATCH is to be a, you know, to turn your school where everyone is working together, everybody speaks the same language, the same vocabulary that creates and maintains a healthy school environment. The whole child approach, it's a new, um, it was a new and improved, you know, in September it was uh, included. Um, it's an effort to focus on the long-term development and the success of all children, where they talk about, you know, the community, the school, the family, everybody is involved in the long-term development of our children. When we speak about the language of CATCH, uh, CATCH blends uh, the coordination through a campus by using a common and consistent language. You will see that our schools will have all these beautiful and updated um, posters around the school. They're gonna be talking about Catch MVP, Go Slow Woe Foods, uh, Mind, Heart, and Body. That's also a new and updated part of our program because the social and emotional learning of our kids is also important. Um, let's see. Now let's talk about MVP. So. The MVP aims to achieve healthy behaviors and positive outcomes in the following areas. Uh, most of us are very familiar with MVP. Everybody knows most valuable player. But in our catch program, we talk about MVP, about uh, being an PE MVP, for example. It means M for move and stay active, V value healthy eating, P practice healthy habits. So when you become an MVP, it's because you probably got caught in the school with a great, great healthy lunch during lunch, uh, you know, in the school, or maybe we saw you that you were chosen water instead of a sugary drink, uh, you're, you know, or you practice healthy habits. You tell us, oh, coach, this weekend I, um, I have a game, you know, we play football, all of those things, we kind of like continue motivating the kids to be active, to value healthy eating, to practice healthy habits. And that's how they earn to be an MVP. Also, teachers and staff, um, you know, everybody can be an MVP. And what I love about this is that when you include the teachers, when you include the, the administrative stuff on the board, they get excited when they see their pictures like, oh, you know, uh, my teacher is an MVP because, and then, you know, I write on it, like why they're an MVP. So all of these things are very motivational and, you know, a learning uh, model for the kids. Go slow, whoa. It's a, it's a vocabulary that has been around in the district for a while because, you know, catch is being revamped. But uh, kids know and differentiate food store go, food store go uh, slow or whoa. Um, I always, you know, compare it to the traffic light. And I always say, hey, everything that is green is a go food. And that means go, it's healthy. It's food that you can eat you know, almost all the time are going to be the type of foods that are lower in fat, they have lower sugar, they have less, they're less processed, they have, you know, low sodium. So my examples are always like, if it comes from nature, if it doesn't have a label that you have to read, it's go food, go for it. Um, slow food are a little higher in fat, they have more, a little bit more sugar, they're a little bit more processed, but there is a little like, limbo and then slow because I always tell the kids you can turn slow food into into go by adding vegetables and fruits and stuff like that but it's a little tiny you know thing line to turn it into whoa because you can also turn your slow into a whoa by just you know adding more cheese or adding more things that are not you know low 
and fat or sugar or sodium. And then whoa are foods that are really, you know, not the best are I call junk food pretty much. It's food that is like more processed, fast food, food that is super high in fat, added sugar, they're most processed. Um, I actually, it's a funny story, but I call Halloween at our school, we call it whoa Halloween because it's pretty much, you know, all candy and it's woe food and they're they they understand and they're like yeah coach but whoa Halloween it's only once a year and I'm like thank god it's only once a year but um goes low food uh, woe foods it's very very popular in the school we play games with them um so when they're playing games they're learning they're learning the vocabulary they talk about it in the cafeteria they talk about it with their teachers um, they go home and they talk about it with their parents. And I've heard uh, parents coming to me that they're like, hey, my kid is like asking me to buy and read labels before we buy the food. Like they're asking me for go foods and I don't know. But I also send information home. So parents are learning about the program. So it's, it's working together. The mind, heart, and body, it's an updated uh, part of CATCH program, and I love it because I'm super embedded in the social emotional learning of our kids. So we bring our whole self to school. That's their main thing. You know, you bring everything to school every day, and you need learning and support in all the areas to learn and thrive. So it's all about mind, heart, and body. And so we, all, we also talk about this, and it's also part of this journey and part of this um, program. Uh, who is involved in the catch? Um, it's everyone. Everyone has a role implementing catch on the campus. Um, as you can see on the pictures, I have Wade and I have Dr. Noel as MVPs in our school. They're also, um, you know, they show that making the right choices, making the right decisions makes you an MVP. Um, eventually, you know, when you start getting a little bit um, with parents, parents can also visit your school and become an MVP as an example for the kids. So everybody is involved. Um, with the program, the CATCH, you also create a wellness team. The wellness team is um, formed with uh, PE teachers, print, uh, an administration, it can be a principal and AP, um, the nutrition director and the cafeteria, the nurse, um, and if you have a teacher from the classroom to be part of the team, this is uh, what it's called a wellness team. And part, I would say you can create a committee that will get together and talk about many ways that you can implement and help catch program in your school. What are the resources? This is the most amazing part of the training I took on September that um, in the past we had like a, a coordination kit it was a book that you have to you know go over and read with this new program the resources are, are online uh the catch coordination kit it's a roadmap pretty much and that will explain everything and it's divided into four themes now you are required to do two in the fall two in the spring uh totally different from the past it was weeks and it was 38 weeks it was a little bit more complicated this one it's amazing you get two um, that you can do, you know, in the fall and then two in the spring. Uh, it's simple, it's doable. It has specific tasks for everyone to be involved. It has all the resources in it. It has letters that you can send to parents, letters you can send to your staff, um, posters that you can print to be put in all over the school to teach the kids. All the tasks are coordinated. So everyone is reinforcing the same health message. And they're ready to make resources. Like I said, you can just, you know, print and, and, and post all over the school. All these resources are on the program that um, Wade has shared with us. And we all have a login and we have all this information ready to go. Um, it takes everyone working together. Uh, like I said, um, even teachers, if the teachers choose to drink water in the classroom instead of soda, they're giving, an, you know, they're doing something for the program. They're giving the example. They're walking and talking what we are preaching about catch. And so it takes, you know, everybody in the school and for the teachers that implemented 
we have now this resource that it's ready to go, ready to um, you know, be implemented and very easy to follow. These are a few uh, pictures of the catch kickoff that we had our Bradley Elementary. It's a whole week of a spirit week. Everybody was talking about being healthy, the future, being part of a team, drinking water, go slow well, being an MVP. Um, you know, your mind, your body, and your heart, it's part of, you know, who you are and you need to bring it to school and you need to be healthy in every area of your life. And so all of these things are being taught across, you know, the district and they're amazing. You'll, you'll see lots of uh, great results on the CATCH program if you have questions. Um, that's it. I really try not to take a lot of the time, even though I could speak for hours about this program. <laughs> but um, that's our catch program that we have now. Thank you, Wade. I, um, I just had a comment. Um, you know, that was a great presentation. Um, Thank you. I, I see that, you know, I'm, I'm in pediatrics, so I see this and you know, we're also seeing increasing rates of like diabetes and um, specifically not necessarily type one diabetes, but type two um, in children because of the obesity, you know, epidemic. And it's definitely something that the American Academy of Pediatrics is advocating for. So I think that this program um, is a great way to do that because um, you have to start, you know, the foundation starts when they're young. Yes. Um, and knowing like what to eat, what's healthy, what's not healthy. Um, and it's more than just, you know, the food groups, I feel, you know, it's about knowing what food, you know, what you're getting from the, the food and if it's good or bad for you and the process, processed food and all of that. I think all of that's really important. So I'm glad that, um, you know, that's discussed as well. Yeah, we love the program. And yes, the kids. They are little sponges. They learn and they go home and they share with their family. And sometimes, you know, like we said, parents now, they both work, they're busy. Sometimes it, they go the easy route, but if the kid comes home and it's teaching the parents, they also, they're like, oh, I didn't know. Now I can make a more educated and healthier version for my kids because my kids are asking for it. And so, yeah, that's, that's the goal of this CATCH program. Any more questions or comments? Coach Orlando, thank you. If you don't mind, stop your screen share. I will. Appreciate it. Dr. Chala, thank you for your comment as well. You know, the thing about this program is that it's very easy to get parents involved. It's so simple and just raises that little bit of awareness at home. You know, I've had children in the district. I still have children in the district and the, the slow, whoa, you know, go. They're like, dad, it's whoa. Or dad, you know, so it's been around for quite a while, you know, but it's just they've really streamlined it and done a really good job. Uh, you know, to do have, have programs to raise more awareness, make it easier, more accessible for teachers, uh, PE coaches, parents, community members, you know, so it's a really great program, you know, and as a uh, coach mentioned, you know, um, just bring awareness to uh, those slow foods. Of course, if you're the one handing out bags of carrots on Sunday night, you're probably going to have your house rolled on Monday, but uh, that's the one day that we, you know, we talk to the kids about, of course, um, but it's a great program. And I really think, uh, you know, the coaches are really doing a great job with it is spreading in a, the way it should within the district and uh, coach Orlando is doing a really good job spreading the word also so thank you coach okay the next item on our agenda is an SEL presentation prepared by Kim Earthman is who's our director of student support services Denise Griffin the coordinator of student support services and Lindsay Taylor mental health specialist uh, Ms. Earthman I wasn't sure who's going to present today um, I'm going to present the information and then Denise and Lindsay are going to jump in if I forget any of the information. All so right, great. thank you. Um, we are very excited that we get to come back to Shack and share some of the work that we've done since June. Um, if you were here in June, we presented some of this information to Shack and then got Shack's approval for um, our I can statements and then some of our curriculum as well. One of the things that we wanted to make sure that we did is um, 
just really review everything to make sure that we were really in alignment with the beliefs, you know, and um, of our community, but also with the law as well. So I'm going to focus for just a couple of slides on um, social emotional learning, why we do it, and the laws that that go behind it. I know that um, sometimes some of you might have heard some different things about social emotional learning. And so we just really wanted to come back to Shaq and, and give you guys some information about it. So everything that we do in Conroe ISD is aligned with state laws, our um, educator commissioner's rules, our Texas education code, our Conroe ISD board policy, and the values of our community. And we hold that very important as we are looking at social emotional learning. Um, I also made, or we made a list of, these are all of the different areas that cover aspects of social emotional learning. And so you can see every front, everything from our um, own Connor ISD board policy um, to Texas education, to house bills and Senate bills that they have passed as well. And so one of the things that um, we're very fortunate to have Denise Griffin and Lindsay Taylor, they went back and actually aligned every single aspect that we've done with social emotional learning to um, one of the laws that is listed there or multiple because they overlap in quite a bit of ways. So when you, when you search social emotional learning, just like everything, right? If you Google something, there are different definitions that are going to come up. And, and as we were doing this, we felt it's very important to just explain to, to you guys and to our school board what it is in Conroe ISD. And so what social emotional learning is in Connor ISD, it's helping students build skills related to managing emotions, establishing and maintaining positive relationships and responsible decision-making to be successful in school. We also wanna use those teachable moments to show examples of respect and responsibility and trustworthiness, caring and, and overall good citizenship. We also sometimes have to have explicit instruction in some of those skills. We want to work with the families and have collaboration for what is being taught at home. Um, and again, we're, it's what is required by the state law. What social emotional learning is not in Connor ISD, it is not proselytizing or indoctrinating um, concerning any specific religious or political belief. And there's actually House Bill 1026 and our Texas Education Code forbids us from doing that. It is not pushing our own personal beliefs on a student. It is not critical race theory. It is also not a replacement for those values taught at home. And we think it's very important um, that as we start to share this information, with our administrators, our staff, our parents, that we're very upfront and transparent about that because it's, it's really important work as, as Coach Orlando was talking about that whole child approach and looking at um, really working with the whole child. We wanna make sure that, that we're really clear about that. So um, in June, we brought to you our I Can statements. We had a logo and you guys gave us some great feedback on that. Um, we went back and we condensed it. It was a little bit too wordy, a little bit too long and kind of overwhelming. And so um, the same concepts, but it is just, we, we condensed them. Um, we made sure that those, again, were aligned to everything. And it was really just a few tweaks and then we were able to present those to our school board as well. So just a little bit about implementing social emotional learning. Um, we wanna make sure that we are integrating with our curriculum. So we are not taking big chunks out of the day and having teachers do yet one more thing. So we've worked very close with our teaching and learning department over the past year and a half to really look at where do these naturally fit in? If we are teaching, um, if we are doing a read aloud with students and we're talking about characters, can we bring in some of those traits like respect, honesty, trustworthiness? It's something that teachers already do. 
Um, it's just bringing a little bit more attention to it. If we're talking in Texas history, actually like in second grade, we talk about patriotism. That is one of the things that state law requires us to teach in school is the traits of good citizenship, things like patriotism. So there's a lot of things that um, very much overlap and are integrated in with that curriculum. We also are going to have some explicit instruction. And so if, if you were here in June, we had um, a group of over 75 teachers, coaches, administrators, and counselors work on a playbook. And so one of the things that we've been doing since then is reviewing all of the lessons, reviewing all of the suggested resources, all of the books, all of the videos, and having multiple people review those. Um, so we can make sure that we're putting the, the best thing forward for our teachers to use in the easiest way possible. And then we also know that we have to have a positive and safe school climate and culture that supports this. And so in Conroe ISD, we have been implementing positive behavior interventions and support school-wide to make sure that we have those um, safe and positive school climates. And so we work very closely with our campuses on our PBIS systems. I also included our timeline, and this is what I had shared with you in June, that really we've been working on this since about July of 2020. Um, we've had a lot of people, um, a lot of people in TNL, a lot of our counselors, a lot of our district coaches, our teachers. We've had so many great people work on this because um, they believe in it and they want it to be such a great product. And so in June is when we came to you and got approval. We then presented at the administrator, the administrators conference. Through August and September, we really just took a little bit of a step back just to review and revise and make sure that we had everything aligned and, and ready to go. We were supposed to um, work with our school-wide PBIS teams, we call them our foundations teams, in September and October on SEL lessons and the playbook and how we could roll this out for our campuses. And then we, it was, um, we were not having staff development at that time. So we kind of had to roll it back a little bit and that's okay, it gives us a little bit more time. So we were able to, to present this to the school board, which we are very excited about to share all of this great work with them um, a couple of weeks ago. In November, we are continuing to make sure we have aligned activities to all of our student outcomes and continue to look at all of the lessons for the playbook. And in that, we're also going to be doing a video for campuses to create an overview of what social emotional learning is and how it is just something we do on a daily basis and how we can easily work on the social emotional learning of the adults in the building. Because we know this is a stressful time for our teachers as well. And um, we really believe these are things that need to be in place. In February, we'll pull our foundations teams back together which we're very excited about. And when we do that, we will um, work with each individual campus on what is the best plan for them to share this information with their, with their teachers and how is the best, best way to start working on this on their campus. And so it will be very individualized um, for all of our campuses, but we're super excited to get to move forward and um, share that information with them on social emotional learning. Are there any questions or comments or anything that you guys would like me to go back to so you could look at? Okay. Lindsay, Denise, do you guys have anything to add? No, you did a great job. Okay. Those two ladies have done a lot of work on this and um, we are very lucky to have them in our district. So um, thank you very much for letting me come back and update you guys on social emotional learning. If you have any questions, just please let us know. All right, thank you, Ms. Earthman. And just to, to reinforce what she said, yeah, Ms. Griffin and Ms. Taylor, uh, they do a wonderful job as well. And Ms. Earthman's team is fabulous. They do a really great job. So thank you so much for the work that you do every day as well.
All right, the next item on our agenda is future topics and meeting dates. Uh, we'll continue with the updates to Proclamation 2022 uh, at our meeting on January 26th. And now Dr. Upshaw kind of outlined this for you. And by the way, just as, as a reminder, these this information will be posted online as well. So timelines, presentations is all available to you uh, within the next several weeks, uh, several days. This will all be online for you to look at as well. And of course, if you have any questions anytime, you can give me an email, I'll get right back to you. Uh, we're also going to have a final review uh, and selection of the instruction materials at our meeting on February 28th. And again, this will all be posted in our meeting uh, minutes, and the draft will be sent to you prior to our next meeting for you to review. Uh, we're also going to continue with calendar invitations and with the reminders for everyone as well. So we'll have all those for you as well. Uh, I just I do want to take a moment to thank uh, someone's kind of behind the scenes, Sarah Blakelock with the Communications Department. She's the director. Uh, they have been fabulous to work with with all this, uh, the changes to the Shack meeting. Uh, she has an amazing team. They've been very patient, very flexible, and we really appreciate that group as well. So thank you, Ms. Blakelock. Okay, with that, we have reached the end of our agenda. The time is 4.33 p.m. If there's no objection, we'll now adjourn the meeting. Okay, hearing no objection, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all so much for being here today, guys. We really appreciate you, and we will see you on January 26th. Thank you so much.